All right, everyone. Welcome back to another episode. Today we have George Stevens Jr. with us. So welcome to the show, man. Um, yeah, pumped to have you on. If you can, just uh, start us off with a little uh, intro, um, just a little bit more about you and who you are. Well, I am uh, I am many things. I am a, a filmmaker, a writer, producer, director. I'm a playwright, and I am the founder of the American Film Institute, and I founded the Kennedy Center Honors, and I've got a pretty good golf game. Oh, love it. <laughs> I need to get better at that. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> um, so uh, first question I have for you, and, and from my research, I understand, I, I think your father was in the business, um, and hence, you know, the junior. But um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Like, what was it like, you know, I guess, I guess you kind of grew up in the industry. Would that be somewhat accurate? I did. I, w I was born in the Hollywood Hospital. Uh, okay, there we go. To start. And my father then was a young director. Um, he uh, he was 30 when he directed his first film, Alice Adams, with Catherine Hepburn and Fred McMurray. <clears throat> and he went on to win a couple of Oscars. And he's, I guess, to it's not at all an exaggeration to say he's one of the great filmmakers of all time. Giant, Shane, A Place in the Sun, uh, <clears throat> Gunga Dean, Swing Time, Astaire and Rogers, uh, and the list goes on. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. So do you have, um, I, did you always know you kind of wanted to like do this as well? Or when you were younger, did you think you'd go down like a different path? I thought I was going to be a sports writer, but um, I, 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 I was around when my father was making films and I got interested in it. And he gave me uh, my senior year of high school. He'd just come back from the war. Uh, and he, I didn't have a job. And he said, well, you can help me. <clears throat> so he gave me two tasks. One was to break down Theodore Dreiser's An American Tragedy, a classic book. Um, and uh, I did that into two notebooks, every character, every scene from parts one and part two, <clears throat> because he was about to start the screenplay for what became based on the Dreiser book that became A Place in the Sun with the star Montgomery Clift and Elizabeth Taylor, Shelley Winters, and uh, was one of the great films. He won his first Oscar for that. And the other was to read the stuff that came from Paramount Studios, uh, where he had his film company. And there were books, novels, a lot of treacly love stories that for a 17 year old were sort of heavy going on warm summer days. But I picked up on, a, on an afternoon and read it that afternoon. And I went to see him that night, he was in bed. And I said, dad, I said, this is, I had the book in my hand. I said, I think this is really a good story. And I think you ought to read it. And he was reading in bed and he said, well, why don't you tell me the story? So I found myself kind of walking around his bed, trying to reconstruct as best I could from my afternoon reading uh, the story of Jack Schaefer's novel, Shane. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, or not of course, but it happened the next summer, uh, I was in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, uh, right next to the camera working at a job called Company Clerk on the making of the historic Western that starred Alan Ladd, Van Heflin, Gene Arthur, Jack Palance, and others. So mm. that was sort of my introduction. And I think he was kind of giving me a, an opportunity to find out whether I had any aptitude for this sort of thing or any interest. Mm -hmm. And gradually I developed an interest that um, surpassed my interest in sports writing. Got it. Okay. Now I just thought of this question. How did your, um, how did your dad get into the business? His parents were actors. My father grew up in San Francisco and okay. his 
father and his mother were an actors and actresses in, on the stage. And his mother's mother had started in the theater. Uh, she was born after the Civil War in San Francisco and became a very prominent actress. Her name was Georgia Woodthorpe. And she is remembered for being the youngest Ophelia to the great Edwin Booth, America's greatest Hamlet, to his Hamlet. And she started five generations of Stevens's in show business. Wow, that's so cool. So this is like a full like family, um, like just completely down. So it's it's been, what would that be? Like a couple hundred years the family's been in the business, right? Something like that. I uh, see. Uh, none. I guess 1860, 1960, 160 years plus. That's so sick. Okay, yeah. got it. That's awesome. Um, okay, so then, you know, obviously your dad's kind of like, I don't want to say testing, but just like seeing if you're into it or not. Turns out you are. What was your, I, li I kind of like these questions. So like, what was your first like biggest success, but also what was your first, did you have like a big failure that you like learned a, a like lesson from? And not really. Um, I, I, I was in the Air Force for two years and I was a motion picture officer. So because I had some background and then I came out and before long I was directing uh, uh, Jack Webb, who started Dragnet, made me a director at 25. And I've directed t t television shows like Alfred Hitchcock Presents and Peter Gunn uh, and Philip Marlowe, the, you know, some of the top television shows of the 50s. Um, and then I went to work with my father on the Diary of Anne Frank, and we worked together on that. Um, and and the, I mentioned a place in the sun, uh, and my my memoir that's out now is called My Place in the Sun: Life in the Golden Age of Hollywood and Washington. And uh, it, uh, you know, of course, is is uh, based on the title of his film. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's also, it's now out in both uh, bookstores and online and also on, um, I recorded, I recorded the audio book. So it's on Amazon and Spotify. Awesome, awesome. So yeah, what, um, when you say the golden age, obviously like I, I know what you mean, but can you go a little deeper on like, how would you describe like, what does it mean the golden age for Washington and Hollywood? Yeah, well, the golden age of Hollywood is pretty much thought of the 30s and 40s. Um, okay. And of course, that's the time that I was growing up and getting started. And uh, there was a major turn in my life right, right after I finished working with my father on the, uh, on the, great, on the Diary of Anne Frank. Uh, Ed, you've heard of Edward R. Murrow, the great broadcaster. Mm -hmm. uh, probably the greatest in my book. He went to work for President Kennedy uh, as head of the United States Information Agency. And Murrow and I met, and at age 29, he, he, I was 29, he wasn't, uh, he asked me to come to Washington to run the motion picture division of the United States Information Agency. And that led to me being there through the new frontier and uh, and I'm still I'm speaking to you from Washington, where I live. Uh, and so I was part of what I call the golden age of Washington, uh, the Kennedy years on through um, the Obama years. Yeah, got it, got it. No, that makes sense. Um, and actually, just to say, I mean, for people that are just listening, you can't see, but I like the way your house looks. It looks pretty awesome back there. <laughs> it's pretty, oh, thank it looks you. Like Looks like cozy or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Um, and, that, and that little thing in the background, that is my Oscar. So. Uh, oh, okay. Oh, uh, yeah. Got it. Yeah. It's a, it's a it's a family habit. Yeah, makes sense. I love that. <laughs> um, what did that? And obviously, I know it was positive feelings, but like when you won that Oscar, wait, how many Oscars do you have? Is it is it one? I, I, 
I have one Oscar and 15 Emmys. I did okay, more television sure. than movies. Yeah. I wanted to make sure because I didn't, I, I just, in case you had like 50 Oscars or something, I was like, <laughs> I want to make sure I ask the question. Um, so winning that Oscar though, what, um, what film did you win it for? And then like, can you share more about the experience of that? I'm just curious. Like, did you, sure. did you, do you ever like know that it's going to happen before or is it a complete surprise? In this case, I did because this okay. was an, an, an Oscar for my life achievement and it was okay. voted by the board of governors. So I was told in advance and, uh, <clears throat> and that it was a very, actually I was producing the Kennedy Center Honors at the time. And that always took place on the first weekend in December. And we had rehearsals all weekend and a Saturday night dinner at the State Department where we, the honorees receive their, their laurels. And then on Sunday, a White House reception, and then the honors, honors gala from the Kennedy Center. And uh, it turned out that the Academy Awards that year were on, uh, the, the, uh, on uh, Saturday night, December 5th. So I had to fly out from rehearsal uh, and then fly back overnight. But it was an exciting two hours <laughs> in yeah. which I received it. And uh, Annette Benning and Sidney Poitier presented me with the Oscars. Sidney was a dear friend, as was Annette, as is Annette. And I worked with Sidney in a number of areas. So being uh, receiving that from prestigious and talented people like uh, Annette and Sydney uh, made it very special. Yeah, that's incredible. Um, I'm curious too. I mean, a lot of our audience, they're authors. So, I mean, it's not necessarily a direct correlation, but it's pretty darn close because a lot of books get turned into movies. Uh, or, okay, actually, I'll start here. What is, um, if, if an author wanted a book to be turned into a movie, is there some sort of like process that you'd recommend? Like, how would you go about doing that? Like, I feel like that would be valuable. I mean, if, if somebody has written a book or they know yeah. a book that they like or what? If, if somebody has written a book and they want to like have it, have it uh, get in front of the right people or give it a chance at becoming a movie or turned into a movie, how do you like go about doing that? Like, what's the process? Um, well, a lot of people have agents and some authors, most authors have agents. And, and agents are very good at that. Okay. They know how to get in front of people. Um, and uh, <clears throat> it, it, if you, uh, I, I would say basically that's the way, or you know, okay. if there's a producer you admire, try and find their address and, and send them the book or send them the reviews. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. So you'd really, essentially what you're saying is like, you know, obviously it'd be a good book, but you'd find a good agency that has a track record of this. And then if they'll take you on, then they could maybe get you in the door. So kind of like relationships in a sense. It uh, is. Yes. <clears throat> gotcha. Um, and then as far as on the flip side, if somebody wanted to, um, cause obviously this is kind of like your family thing, but say if like an outsider wanted to try to get into the industry, is there a way you'd recommend that? Or would you basically just say like, you know, make good film? Cause now in the social media world, I feel like you could make really good things, post them online, and then you could be seen and then kind of brought in. Do you think that's a good way? No, I, 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 I think it's, it's more democratic than it used okay. to be. I think yeah. that because, you know, when I was growing up, you know, most cameras were big 35 millimeter cameras and you had to have that expensive film, you know, but when video came along, uh, people are, are now able to do such good work. Um, and, uh, and most people who are, who want to do that have kind of got it figured out, you know, that their way of getting your, work in front of people and there are festivals and uh, oh, yeah. museums and all different ways and uh, and people who are anxious to do that usually have a pretty good idea of how to try and get noticed it's never easy but uh, it's uh, or sometimes it is sometimes people have you know lightning strikes yeah 
No, no, that makes sense. And I forgot there are there's like film festivals, uh, like I think Cannes Film Festival or something like like there's all these. Well, yeah, and in the United States, there's South by Southwest, the New York yeah. Film Festival, and a lot of smaller film festival, regional film festivals. Um, in in Minnesota, there's a festival every year, and it, it, there are ways that people kind of get into that world, you know, or many people are. Maybe maybe they've started out and they're working as an assistant or something uh, in New York or in Hollywood or in some uh, film community. Mm -hmm. And then as far because um, this ties directly with our audience, as far as the book goes, when um, let's start from the beginning on that. Like, when did you decide you wanted to write a book? And then what was it? What was it actually like, like the process of writing a book? <laughs> um, yeah. well, everything's different. Mike, mine is, of course, is a memoir, <clears throat> and I've, I'm a writer. I mean, I write television, I write uh, plays, movies. So it, it was, it, and I'd, I'd done two books previously, and but in this case of a memoir, I collected things and kept things and led a very interesting life um, with a lot of interesting people. And so I was conscious that one day I might want to do it. And then I sort of just many years ago, I kind of scoped out, kind of traced my life and said, well, this was interesting. And, you know, uh, I got, a, you know, working on movies when I was in the Air Force, I was a motion picture officer, as I mentioned, but I was making these films on the flight line in Panama City, a Tyndall Air Force base, making training films about how to fly an F-86D jet interceptor. And, and I felt like kind of a wimp. So a friend of mine and I were, were driving around one day and we, in Florida, and we saw this hangar and it said in white letters, it painted rides on the side of this red hangar. And we went over to the hangar and a guy walked up in a red cap and said, my name's Jack. He said, I'll teach you to fly for a hundred dollars. <laughs> And so we signed up for flying lessons. Uh, the $100 was worth more than $100 now. Um, sure. and, and it was 10 one-hour lessons. And after seven lessons, I was flying. And then my friend and I bought a small plane and we flew it to Cuba. So I have all these kind of stories that uh, <laughs> That's awesome. know, I started putting it together. Um, and, and then I just started writing. Um, well, uh, tell, I want to hear more about this Cuba trip. What happened? <laughs> oh, well, it was great. We, you know, we had to take a little 90 horsepower plane. We didn't, uh, uh, I remember our survival kit was a box with ham sandwiches, a bottle of scotch, and uh, <laughs> some, some bandages. Yeah. You know, except we were sort of rookie pilots. You know, it was 100, 100 miles over water from we were in Orlando and flew down to Key West and, and it was great. And the, and the climax of it was one afternoon, we went into the Floridita bar and which is famous uh, because of the author who was, was known for hanging out there. And it was just a kind of five o'clock on a Thursday afternoon. And we looked over and there in a kind of bush jacket having his first, uh, uh, dikery of the day was uh, Ernest Hemingway. And uh, so we thought, you know, our trip is complete. Uh, I think he called it a Papa Doble, his drink. So we had a couple of pa Papa Dobles and uh, <laughs> we didn't bother him, but we were in, you know, That's two amazing. tables. So that was wow. okay. We got back in our little plane and flew home. That's so cool. That's actually one of the sickest stories I've ever heard. Um, <laughs> that's so wild. Um, okay, so if you were to pick out from your book, maybe like, I don't know, two more stories that are somewhat, they don't have to be similar to that, but are there any that like stick out that you think would be like a good teaser that you'd be like, hey, here's a couple well, of stories. I mean, they're just so many. I mean, because of the people I was associated with, and I have reason to write about them. I mean, I, I, was, I met Elizabeth Taylor 
um, when I was 17, uh, and she was about the same uh, when she was shooting A Place in the Sun, and she was a friend throughout my life. And so there are stories about Elizabeth and, uh, and you know, the people I've associated with in the Kennedy Center Honors. One story, uh, when I was working for Ed Murrow in Washington, uh, President Kennedy uh, was very inspiring figure. And I loved his, his speeches and he, he quote, had wonderful quotes and he read the ancient Greeks and quoted the Greeks occasionally. And I wrote down one because he, he described the Greek definition of happiness, mm. um, which is the fullest use of one's powers along lines of excellence. And I realized I was making uh, 300 documentaries a year with young filmmakers to be shown overseas by USIA. And it was, and we really aspired to excellence. And I realized that Ed Murrow and President Kennedy had given me my passport to Greek happiness. I was exercising my powers along lines of excellence. And I <clears throat> made a film, we made a lot of films about uh, President Kennedy and one was about his uh, trip to Berlin in 1963, uh, where he went to the Berlin Wall and made his famous Ich bin ein Berliner speech. And it was a, a wonderful documentary called The Five Cities of June. And I was, it was being distributed overseas and I was in Ed Murrow's staff meeting with about 20 people, senior foreign service officers, the head of the Voice of America and me, the motion picture. And, and my deputy came in and handed me a note. And I looked at it and kind of glanced at Murrow and excused myself. And my office was just one flight downstairs. And I walked in and my secretary said, in reference to the note, she said, I'll get Mrs. Lincoln back on the line. And I walked in and sat down, picked up the phone, and President Kennedy's assistant, Evelyn Lincoln, came on the line and said, I'll put the president on, Mr. Stevens. And I waited and there was that voice. We had met and he said, hello, George. He said, I saw the five cities of June last night. I, I think it's the best government documentary I've ever seen. And as he was known to do, he had tremendous curiosity. He said, how many countries is it being shown in? Is it being translated in other languages? And we had this back and forth about this film. And, uh, and I never expected to be talking on the phone with the president. You know, I just turned 30. And, uh, and then suddenly he said, well, he said, keep up the good work. Uh, thank you. And he was gone. <laughs> and I went back into Murrow's office and sat down and told my deputy had told Murrow, you know, and he said, well, you want to tell us about your phone call? And so I described it. And it was so moving because these foreign service officers who, you know, had been in government for a long time, many of them very talented, they were so moved to hear that President Kennedy had called one of them, essentially, uh, that he cared that much about what we were doing. And it was one of Kennedy's uh, kind of techniques and one of his qualities that he wanted to talk to the person doing the work. You know, it, he could have called Murrow, but he called me. And it made everybody in that agency kind of, they were, their step was a little faster the next day. Yeah, that's incredible. I love that. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I can't, especially at 30 years old, I can't imagine like, talking to the president at 30. <laughs> that's pretty cool. Um, that's awesome. Um, and then he, then he, two weeks later, I was in Los Angeles and, uh, and I'd been out late three hours earlier than Washington and my secretary called and she said, Mrs. Lincoln just called with the president. I gave her your number. And so I'm thinking, do I have time to get into the bathroom and splash some cold water on my face? And as I got out of bed, 
the phone rang and I was, you know, in that moment of uncertainty. And I said, I can't do that. So I went and picked up the phone and it was, pre and she put President Kennedy on. And he said, George, he said, how, how are we doing with the five cities of June? And I said, well, great. And I added a few things. He says, well, I think you ought to enter it in the Academy Awards. <laughs> and, and so I said, actually, we've already done that, Mr. President. And he said, okay, fine. And he was gone. You know, and I, and I, you know, he's in Washington in the Oval Office. What does he, what does he turn to now <laughs> that he's finished calling me about the Academy Awards? I know. But it's so interesting. He was really an inspiring, an inspiring uh, figure. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Well, look, here's what I want to do. If, if there's anything we didn't cover, please share it. Um, I think, uh, you know, for everybody listening, at least from my standpoint, I feel like in this interview, all I want now is to know more. So I think that's kind of the goal sometimes of these is, you know, you, you give give a lot of value, give some story, but now I want to read the entire book. So regardless, if there's anything that we didn't cover, please share it and then let people know how they can like stay in contact with you and um, uh, where the book is and all that. Great. Okay. Well, wonderful. Uh, yes. The, well, the book is called My Place in the Sun. Life in the Golden Age of Hollywood in Washington. Um, and it's, uh, you know, at the usual places. Um, and, uh, uh, and I have a website that's, that's all lowercase letters, George Stevens, J-R, S-T-E-V-E-N-S, uh, dot com. And that's my website. And you can track me down there. And it's very nice to have, talked with you and your listeners, Tyler. Thank you, man. Thank you so much for coming on. I enjoyed it. And yeah, some of the stories, I really am like, wow. <laughs> they're so awesome. no, it, is, it is a book full of stories. And yeah. I, I have to say, people really love it because, you know, and they're, and they're to the point. I edited this book very carefully. So mm -hmm. it moves from one to the other. And it's also a book of aspiration and, uh, uh, you know, it, 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 dealing with people who really, uh, these artists that we work with on the Kennedy Center Honors for, uh, for 37 years, ranging from, you know, Isaac Stern to Led Zeppelin to Bob Dylan to Jesse Norman and Sidney Poitier and Jack Lemmon, dear friends of mine. And uh, so people really, find it interesting and so I'm happy to I'm I'm not embarrassed to give them a tip on it <laughs> yeah no man it's amazing thank thank you again I appreciate it okay Tyler good night